With Godot 4 downloaded and extracted, it's time to create our project. Upon opening the Godot 4 application, we're greeted with the Project Manager screen. This screen serves as a base for all of the projects that you'll create using Godot, as well as giving you a way to browse the public Godot Asset Library projects, which is particularly useful if you're looking for a particular bit of functionality or inspiration. One useful thing to note here is that you will always be able to tell exactly what version of the Godot game engine you're running by looking at the top right of the Project Manager. Here you see at the time of this recording I'm running Godot version 4, Alpha 15. From the Project Manager screen, click on the New Project button on the right hand side. This will open up the Create New Project dialog. This window allows us to specify our project name, which we'll call Raptor Run, as well as a path for where we'd like to store our project file. If you didn't specifically create a folder for your project, you can click the Create Folder button next to the project name to allow Godot to create the folder for you. Below these options, we're given a choice of rendering engine for our game. You can read a detailed description of each renderer here to establish which renderer would be the most suitable for your particular project. But for now, we'll choose the Vulkan Clustered Renderer, which is specifically targeted towards desktop games. The final option allows us to specify whether or not we'd like to make our project metadata compatible with the Git version control system. We'll leave this as default. Now click the Create and Edit button. Godot will now create your project and open the editor. Let's run through the most common parts of the Godot interface, so that you can familiarise yourself with where things live. Starting at the top left, we have the Scene, Project, Debug, Editor and Help menus. The Scene menu is where you'll go when you wish to open, save or create a new scene. In Godot, almost everything is a scene, whether that be your main menu screen, a level in your game or even your player. The project menu allows us to access our project settings window, as well as perform various project related tasks, such as configuring version control and exporting our game. The debug menu is extremely useful when developing your game, as it allows you to toggle various debug options such as visualising the collision boxes of objects during runtime. The editor menu allows you to configure the actual Godot editor to your liking. This includes accessing and configuring a wide array of editor settings, as well as saving and loading custom editor layouts, which can be handy when getting into various workflows such as animating. Finally, the help menu is where you'll go if you're stuck and need to reference documentation, or perhaps if you find a bug within Godot itself and wish to report it. It's also where you can find helpful links to the Godot community forum, as well as find out more information about how to support this fantastic open source game engine. Before we continue any further, if this is not your first time running the Godot editor, your layout may not look the same as mine if you've ever previously changed any settings. To make sure we're all looking at the same thing, let's go to the Editor menu, choose Editor Layout, and select Default. Looking over at the left hand side of the editor now, we can see the Scene panel. This is where you'll manage the current scene's hierarchy of nodes. A node is essentially a building block, and they come in many different forms, such as an animated sprite node or a collision shape node. Your game will be composed of many nodes, some with nodes of their own as children, forming a tree-like structure. This might sound confusing right now, but as we progress it will become much clearer. Every scene must define a root node, and right now the scene panel is asking us to create a root node. You can see that we have a few different options to get us started. Since Raptor Run will be a 2D game, we'll choose the 2D Scene option. You'll notice that our scene panel now has a single node, called Node 2D. This is the most basic 2D node that we can create in Godot, and mostly serves as a base for other more complex 2D nodes. The keen-eyed among you may have also noticed that the main portion of the editor has now also changed from what was a 3D representation of our scene to a flat 2D representation. We'll look at this in more detail shortly, but for now let's quickly look at some other functions of the scene panel before we move on. Looking at the top of the panel, above where we have our root node, you can see a few UI elements. The plus button opens the Create New Node panel. This is where we can add new nodes to our scene. I briefly mentioned before that nodes in Godot are like building blocks, sort of like Lego bricks. Well if our nodes are Lego bricks, the Create New Node panel is our box of bricks. It contains a list of all possible nodes that we can add to our game. Feel free to stop here and have a look through some of the options that are available. Clicking on a node type will give you a brief description of what it does in the description box at the bottom of the panel. Once you're done browsing, close the window for now by clicking the cancel button. 
It's also worth mentioning at this point that we can also access this dialog by right-clicking on a node in our scene hierarchy and choosing the Add Child Node option. We'll use this method a lot. The next button that looks kind of like a chain link is the Instantiate Child Scene button. Clicking this will open up the Instantiate Child Scene window. Earlier I mentioned that in Godot, everything is made up of scenes. This is where that design philosophy comes into play. Once you've created a scene, you can include it inside other scenes, effectively allowing you to compartmentalize different parts of your game and compose them as necessary. Imagine for a second that we have a player scene, which contains our player's sprite and collision shape. Let's also imagine that we have a level scene that contains all of the environment, such as the ground and the platforms. We could use this option from within our level scene to add our player to the level. Again, if this sounds confusing, that's okay. We'll use scene composition later on to do exactly this. So for now, let's move on. The text area that says filter nodes and has a little search icon does exactly what it says on the tin. Entering text here will filter the scene hierarchy to show only nodes that match the text you've entered. We can demonstrate this by typing hello in the box and watching our node 2D disappear from the list. If we replace hello with node, you'll see our node 2D comes back. This is very handy as your scene grows and you want to find a particular node quickly. For now, click on the cross to clear the text field and remove the filter. The next button is the Attach Node Script button. Clicking it will bring up the Attach Node Script dialog, where we can create a script to customize the behavior of this particular node. We'll dive into this a bit later, so for now, click the Cancel button. The last button here is the three little dots. Clicking this will show a checkbox that allows us to specify whether we want our scene hierarchy to automatically expand to whatever object we select in the scene viewport. For example, if you clicked on a platform in the scene viewport, the big area in the center of the screen, the scene panel would automatically jump to and highlight the appropriate node in the hierarchy to show what you selected. This is very handy and I would advise leaving this on for now, but it's useful to know that the option is available to toggle here if necessary. Before we move on, let's rename our root node to something more meaningful. I recommend renaming it something like World. Right click and choose Rename. Alternatively, you can press F2 if you're on Windows. Let's call it World and hit Enter. Now head over to the Scene menu and click Save Scene. You can also press Ctrl and S if you're on Windows. This will open up the Save Scene dialog. First, let's create a new folder to keep all of our scenes neatly organized. Click the Create Folder button at the top right and call the folder Scenes. Now come down to the File Name input box and let's name our scene main.tscn and hit Save. With our main scene saved, it's a good time to move on to the file system panel below. This panel is quite self-explanatory, it essentially allows you to see all the files and folders within your game's project. Godot refers to the base file path of your game as res colon slash slash, and you can see this in the path bar at the top, as well as being shown at the root of our game's folder structure in the file browser below. You'll see that we now have a single folder inside our game's file structure, this being our scenes folder we just created. Expanding this by clicking on the small arrow to the left of the name will show us all the files inside that particular folder. Of course, we only have one right now, our main.tscn file. Over time, this view will grow as we add and create new assets within our folder, so it's a good idea to think about how you'll organise your game's assets early on so that you can quickly find what you're looking for. Similar to the scene panel, we have a few different options here. The button at the top right that looks like two rectangles allows us to separate the file system view into a folder view and a file view. This is sometimes handy, but personally I prefer to stick to the default hierarchical view, so let's switch back to that. Below that we have a filter field, similar to what we have in the scene panel. Entering a text value here will allow you to filter for certain files by name. To the right of the filter option there's a sort button. Clicking this will give you a few different options for sorting your files, such as by name or by type. We'll leave this option as default too. Moving over to the right hand side of the editor now, we can see the inspector. The inspector is where you can view and configure various options on the currently selected node. If you don't see anything here, come over to your scene panel and click on the world node. That should populate the inspector with all of the world node properties. We'll skip over the buttons at the top left of the inspector as they're related to editing, loading and saving resources, which is not something we'll be using for now. The buttons at the top right, however, are worth going over as they can be extremely useful when switching between configuring nodes. These buttons act like buttons you may find in a web browser and allow you to go back and forward between nodes you've been editing. 
as well as view a history of recent nodes you've looked at. The drop down below is something we won't go into too much detail on here, but it allows you to navigate through the various sub resources of a particular node. Again, this is not something we'll be making use of for now. The button to the right of this drop down, however, is another extremely useful button. Clicking it will take you directly to the documentation for a particular node type, right inside the Godot editor itself. From here, you can see and read everything you could possibly want to know about this node type, including what it is, what properties and functions it has available, as well as where it sits in the inheritance tree. It's worth pointing out that anywhere you see a bit of underlined text is a link to the documentation for that particular thing. For example, clicking on Vector2 will take you to the documentation for the Vector2 class, which will show you that it's a two-element structure that can be used to represent positions in 2D space. This makes learning all about particular nodes and classes within Godot a breeze, as you don't have to leave the editor if you don't want to. You may have noticed when opening the documentation that we lost our view of the 2D scene. Don't worry, looking at the top of the editor you can see four options. These are 2D, 3D, Script and Asset Library. Clicking any of these changes the main viewport of the editor. For now, click back on 2D to get back to where we were before. Coming back to the Inspector panel, we have a Filter Properties input area. I'm sure by now you're familiar with how this works, entering a text value here will filter the list of properties below. To the right of the filter input there's a button that looks like a screwdriver and wrench. Clicking this gives us a few inspector related options, such as expanding and collapsing all properties, or configuring how property names look. Now we come to the guts of the inspector panel, the properties section. Here is where you can modify specific parts of a node. One of the most common things you'll be modifying is a node's transform. This defines precisely where in our game the node lives. In our case, we're in 2D space. Click on the little arrow next to the transform to expand it. You can see that here you can define the node's position, its rotation in degrees, as well as its scale and skew. If you're ever unsure what a particular property does, you can hover your mouse over the label for a second or two, and you'll see a tooltip open that describes what it is. For example, Let's hover our mouse over the position property, and we can see that it says position relative to the node's parent. This means that if a node's parent were at 100 on the x coordinate, and this node's x value is 10, this node would be at an x coordinate of 110 in the game. This can sometimes trip people up when defining an object's location, so it's worth remembering that the position defined in the inspector is always relative to the node's parent position. We won't cover all of the properties now, as each node has different properties available but feel free to take a moment now to have a look at the properties available on the base node 2D. Remember to hover over the property name to see a description of what it is. Once you're done looking through the inspector, click on the node tab which sits right next to it. This tab has two subsections, signals and groups. Signals are Godot's way of allowing nodes to emit events, which we can listen for in our game's code and respond accordingly. We'll cover this in more detail as we get into writing the code for our game, but know that signals can either be wired up in the nodes panel, or directly via code. In most cases, you'll want to wire them up via code, but it's useful to know that this option exists. Groups allows us to categorise our nodes. For example, we may wish to create a group called Enemy, and tag each of our enemy nodes with it. In fact, this is something we will be doing later. For now, for demonstration purposes, Let's create a group called Example by writing Example in the input field and clicking Add. Looking over at the Scene panel, you'll see our World node now has a little square with a dot in the middle next to it. This tells us that this node belongs to one or more groups. Hovering over this icon tells us which group this node belongs to. Before we move on, back in the Node panel, click on the Manage Groups button. Doing this will open up the Group Editor dialog, where we can see all of the groups within our project, as well as which nodes in our scene are not in a particular group, and which ones are. This window, while useful, is not always necessary to use, but it is worth knowing it exists if groups are something you plan to make heavy use of in your game. We'll see why groups are helpful later, particularly when it comes to checking collisions between objects. By now we've gone over the majority of the editor's UI, but we haven't covered the big panel slap bang in the centre of the screen. This is the viewport. This is where you'll be spending most of your time within the Godot editor, whether it be composing your game scenes in the 2D or 3D view, writing scripts for your various nodes in the script view, or browsing the various available assets in the asset library view. For now, we'll focus just on the 2D view. At the top of the 2D view, you have the toolbar, 
Here you can perform a variety of actions, such as select which tool you're currently using, configure how selecting objects works, enable and disable object snapping, as well as configure the grid for precise object movement. You can lock and group nodes, and more. As before, take a moment to familiarize yourself with the toolbar and see what options are available. Similar to most elements of the Godot UI, you can hover your mouse over an element to see a tooltip with more information. Pay particular attention to the options under the View button. This will allow you to enable and disable various visual aids inside the 2D view, such as the ruler and the guidelines. Moving on to the main 2D viewport now, this is where you'll be able to visualize your game and position objects within your scene. You can navigate this viewpoint with your mouse in a few different ways. Firstly, holding your middle mouse button will allow you to pan around the scene. Scrolling in and out with the scroll wheel will allow you to zoom in and out. Left clicking on an object in the scene will select it. To manipulate objects, you can use the Move, Rotate and Scale tools. You can select these using the toolbar buttons, or with the W, E and S keys respectively. When using one of these tools, you'll see a manipulation gizmo appear over your object. For example, if we select the Move tool, we can see two arrows appear over our object. Clicking and dragging one of these arrows will allow you to move the object along that axis. To drag your object freely, click and drag anywhere in the viewport while the Move tool is selected. Experiment with moving, scaling and rotating the world object. Once you're done, head over to the inspector with your world node selected and navigate to the transform properties. You'll see little circular arrow icons appear next to any property that you've modified. Clicking these will allow you to reset the properties to their default values. Do this now to reset the position, rotation and scale of the world node back to the default values. It's worth noting at this point that you may hear me use the words node and object interchangeably. Typically I'll use the word node when referring to an element in the scene panel, inspector or script view, and the word object when referring to the visual representation of that node in the viewport. Just be aware that this is a personal thing, and for all intents and purposes when you hear me say node or object, I'm referring to the same thing. There's one more section of the UI that we'll cover before we start work on our game properly. Coming up to the top right of the editor, you'll see five buttons. Play, pause, stop, and two that look like little clipboards. The play button will launch your game quickly in debug mode, opening whichever scene you've configured as your main scene. You'll use this a lot to test changes you make. The pause button will allow you to pause the execution of your game when it's running. This can be useful for debugging when things go wrong. The stop button will stop your game and close the window, bringing you back to the editor. The clipboard with the small play button inside will launch your game similar to the play button. However, it will always launch your game with the current scene that you're editing. This is useful if say you wish to test a particular level scene, but don't want the game to start at the main menu scene. The clipboard with the folder icon inside will allow you to specify a specific scene and quickly launch your game with that particular scene. For now, click on the play button. You'll see that it's telling us that we've not yet defined a main scene. Choose Select Current, and you'll see that our game launches in a new window. Right now our game is just a blank grey screen, so for now, close this window or hit the stop button to close it. 